Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the West Plains Christian Church. <clears throat> For our scripture this morning, we're going to read from the second chapter of the book of Philippians. And we're going to read uh, the second chapter, the 14th verse, which says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, it, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And we're also going to read from 1 Thessalonians, uh, the last uh, chapter, starting with the 16th verse. And Paul tells us, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Last Sunday, uh, Judy Norton challenged our Sunday school class to go an entire week without complaint. I'm not, I'm not sure some of us made it out of class. <laughs> But <clears throat> this week, I'm going to challenge all of you to do the same thing. And since our Sunday school class has a head start, we've already been practicing on this and we've got good at it. I'm going to add to that this week, give thanks in all things. Let's pray. Fathers, we come into your house this morning. We're grateful. Thank you for your love. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his death. And thank you that by his blood, we're made whole. In his name we pray. Amen. I invite you to take your hymnals, turn to hymn number, <clears throat> hymn number 66, to God be the glory, great things he hath done. Hymn number 66. Let's stand together and be saved. <clears throat>
change verse, but that's okay. 191, there is power in the blood. <laughs>
and uh, when I have uh, in other spots or places um, I haven't been leading any song before so pardon me just a second water This song has uh, quite a message and really quite a story. You probably, if you're on Facebook, have read the story to this hymn many, many times. Um, written by a Rachel Spafford, who was a wealthy real estate investor and lawyer in Chicago. He had four daughters, his wife Anna, and they had one son. And that son passed away at the age of four with uh, pneumonia. Some say scarlet fever, but at the same time, a little later, the Great Chicago Fire. And they just lost everything. But they had their four daughters, wife, and a racial. So he thought, well, it's time for a vacation. But business kept him in Chicago. But he sent his wife and his four daughters on to England. Well, during that voyage across the Atlantic, a huge cargo ship collided with the ship that they were on. And he had been given the news, but no results yet. And uh, the wife was rescued at sea by a a uh, gentleman out in a, a large boat, fishing boat. Uh, she was hanging on to a piece of wood and uh, he got her to a larger ship and then sailed on into Cardiff Oils. She wired her husband, Horatio, and said these words, saved alone, what shall I do? Well, he left for England and at one point, the captain of the ship came to him and said, Sir, this is where the accident occurred. I thought you might want to know. At that time, he sat down and he penned the words, Do it as well with my soul. They came back, had three more children. One of the child died. Then they moved to Jerusalem. And Rachel Spafford is buried in Jerusalem. But here's the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Oh, mm -hmm. 
said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. That is not always a simple thing to do until you understand that all is well. That God takes every circumstance in life and works it together for good to them that love him. Aren't you thankful for that today? Amen. Amen. Uh, Kelly Allen could not be here today. Um, she has been exposed to COVID by three of her students this past week. And even though that protocols have changed somewhat and that she is not experiencing any uh, effects, any symptoms whatsoever, we thought that it would be best to err on the side of caution, and so she is not with us today. But filling in for her is uh, my wife, Becky. And so she's going to take you downstairs today, and there's a little project that she has for you that might just help Pastor Rick in his message today. And so I'm going to go ahead and dismiss uh, the kids to go down to Sunshine Kids, you will be going to the fellowship hall this morning due to uh, some air conditioning uh, problems that we're having over in the uh, other wing. And so uh, we'll look forward. They're going to actually be coming back in in a little bit to, uh, to join us 
And so we'll look forward to that. Uh, I don't know really whether I should even preach today. Because that's really going to test that uh, what, what Edward said earlier about not complaining <laughs> this week. Uh, I'd hate for y'all to get, you know, not even be able to get out of the sanctuary without saying something about me preaching too long or already preached that before or whatever. But uh, I'm going to preach anyway. I'm, I'm going to put you to the test. And uh, we'll see how it goes from there. Uh, but before I do that, uh, thank you so much for that song this morning, Larry. Uh, and it has been too long since you did that. And I know that you've been battling uh, some issues with your voice as well. I appreciate that song. I couldn't have asked for a better song uh, to be sung today. And uh, so I thank you for that. Um, before we look to our prayer needs, I want to say that we have uh, proof today that prayer works. Sitting over in the wing is Becky Lott. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't put it down on the calendar, and so I'm not exactly sure how many months it has been since she's been able to be in church. But I know it's been a long time. And we have certainly missed her. And we have been in constant prayer that this day would take place. And uh, so finally it did. And to God be the glory. All praise belongs to him. We are thankful for what uh, doctors can do. <clears throat> We're thankful for modern means by which they can uh, do almost the miraculous. But the only one that can do the miraculous is Jesus Christ. And he has certainly blessed us uh, by uh, taking care of Becky during these long, dark months. And now today, uh, the light shines brightly and we are so thankful to be able to worship with her in-house again with us today. Now, if you were not here last week, and if you did not uh, get the email, uh, she is here, but under some restrictions. And so we cannot hug her. And I wanted to so bad this morning, but I thought, man, the preacher can't be the first one. <laughs> and uh, to set that example, we can't shake her hand. We can't hug her neck. We'll just have to do that at a distance but uh, we are so glad that she is here today and we give God the thanks. There are many who are still in need of their own miracle. And we are mindful of them today. My nephew Hayes began his chemo treatment day before yesterday. Uh, it was a 22 hour treatment. And then after that, they started another one that was going to be another 14 hours. And uh, he did get some rest last night. We're thankful for that. Uh, but we are trusting and believing God to uh, intervene uh, because doctors can do so much, but it takes the Lord to heal. The Bible said he's the healer. And so we put all of that in the hands of the Lord today and ask God to minister, not only to him, but to his family, to my sister, uh, who is in much need of rest. Uh, she is spending a lot of time at the hospital. And so we uh, ask that you would remember all of them in prayer. Uh, also, uh, a few days ago, my oldest sister, Ruby, uh, had a biopsy done on her lung and 
the results came back and it is, and I, you know, for all of those big words I talked about last week in my sermon of learning, medical terms was not in that group. But she has a very rare, uh, extremely uh, slow growing uh, tumor in her lung. And it will require uh, a little bit of surgery, uh, but the doctors have said it's completely curable. It uh, is caught at the very earliest stage. And so we're trusting that all of that would go well. But uh, anytime you, you hear something like that, uh, there, there's, there's this anxiety that grips you. And so I would ask that you would add my sister Ruby to your prayer list and that you would remember her in prayer. Alma Holman is back in town. She's at Brookhaven and she will be undergoing some rehab for uh, a couple, uh, three weeks, but we are thankful that she's back uh, here and uh, we're trusting and believing that she will make a complete recovery and return home. Uh, we also want to be mindful of all of the needs that are on our list and to be faithful in calling them out in prayer. If you have a need today, if you would acknowledge it by an uplifted hand, we'll take our cares to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your faithfulness to being with us when we gather to worship. And Father, we thank you today for hearing our petitions and welcoming them. So Father, today as we come before you, you have heard every need you are aware of every need represented by an uplifted hand. You know every name that is on our prayer list. We lift them all up to you today, asking, Lord, that you would minister. Lord, that you would minister grace and mercy, healing, miracles. Father, that you would minister peace and comfort and strength. Father, today we pray that you would just reach out and minister according to your will and according to your purpose, that you will be true to your word to work all things together for good. Father, we thank you for what you've done. And Lord, we know what you're able of doing. And so we just put it in your hands today, trusting you, believing you. And Father, knowing that the greatest gift that you gave us was not life, but the greatest gift you gave us was the chance at eternal life. And so Lord, today I pray that every heart is made ready. Lord, that we can say deep within ourselves, even though the storms may be brewing, even though there uh, are things in our life that are beyond our comprehension, that we can say with full confidence that all is well. Father, we pray that you would be with us throughout the remainder of this service. Help me today, Father, to minister those things you placed in my heart to share. Be with your people wherever they are today. Forgive us of our sins. Help us, Lord, to live better lives that are reflective of you. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. One announcement before we go to the word of the Lord on Sunday, September the 11th, I believe that is two weeks from today, we will be having a fellowship meal after service that morning. There is a sign-up sheet out in the hallway on the uh, bulletin board. Uh, the church will be providing, I think, ham and chicken strips, and uh, then we'll have all the sides to go with that. So if you can help us out with that, uh, be sure to sign up. And uh, it's been a while since we've had a fellowship meal. And so uh, we'll look forward to that in a couple of weeks. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me this morning to the book of Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, 
Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? My message today is color outside the lines. Color outside the lines. Lord, thank you for your word. I pray now that you would bless them to our understanding. Open our hearts to receive it today. Help me to be able to minister it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My scripture text begins the narrative concerning the Good Samaritan. <clears throat> And that story offers many avenues that have often been examined and preached about. There's a lot of different trails we can take with this story. We can focus on the two religious men that kept walking. We could talk about the injured man himself. A sermon could be centered around the innkeeper that cared for him. But we usually concentrate our thoughts on the man who actually stopped. The one who took the time and made the effort to help. The the man who is called the Good Samaritan. And, and every tentacle to this story offers us some life lessons, but what often gets overlooked in this passage is the one that the story is really about. Because the story is really not about the man that was injured. It's really not about the two religious men that pass by. It's really not about the Good Samaritan. And so we're going to look at it again this morning from a perspective that I've never preached about. A man described as a lawyer has approached Jesus and asked him a question. Now, he isn't what we picture as a lawyer today. This is not someone who is well-versed in a secular legislative system that counsels and represents clients in legal matters. This man is a religious lawyer. He has dedicated his life to the study of the first five books of the Bible. A portion of the Bible that is known as the Torah. It means the teachings or the law. And so this religious scholar has studied all of the finer points of the law of Moses. He knows it inside and out. He carefully follows all of the mandates as they are written in those five books. He is a guy who colors inside the lines. He, he's very meticulous about following exactly how the law should be applied in every situation imaginable. How many steps can be taken on the Sabbath? What you need to do if you've touched a dead person. What the proper way is to clean your pots. Because that was how you showed your love for God by following His demands to the very nth degree. And so He asked Jesus a question to test Him. And it's a pretty, pretty fairly simple question. 
He asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now today that question would be answered with a doctrinal dissertation dependent upon whatever denominational dogma one is associated with. But Jesus responds with a very basic answer. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. It is the two, ta uh, two tables of the Ten Commandments distilled down into their most fundamental essence. The answer that Jesus gave was very fundamental. It was as basic as it gets. Love God. Love your neighbor. And he indeed makes the point here that the law boils down to love. And then the man asks a follow-up question. And Luke tells us something here that's very interesting. Luke tells us that this man wanted to justify himself. That means that he wants to be found standing within the boundary lines. He wants his actions to be judged as being correct and true within the law of God. And so when it comes to how he treats his neighbor, well... He, he's not so sure. It, it, it's going to depend on who exactly is defined as his neighbor. Where, where are the lines drawn on who qualifies? And so this man wanting to justify himself asked a follow-up question and that question was very lawyerly. But as we know, the law is one thing. How we interpret its meaning is a much different matter. And that's true in how we interpret God's law as well as our secular laws. Because we know that lawyers can... Uh, warp and they can distort the law toward their own desired ends. To us, the law seems like an indelible line that is etched into stone, but it's possible to bend those hard lines of the law through our own interpretation. And that's exactly what this lawyer wants to do. His question and its timing lead us to believe that he hasn't exactly treated everyone kindly. It's as if his conscience is being troubled. But depending, depending upon what the definition of neighbor is, his actions might just be justified. And, and so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Because he wants to define the parameters of who qualifies as a neighbor because if they fall under the law, he's going to be okay. He wants a distinction of those who might stand on the other side of that neighborly line. And so they're not under the law. And so therefore of no concern to him. He tosses out his follow-up question hoping that Jesus would take the bait. But instead Jesus turns the question on its side. And he begins to tell this lawyer a story about this man that was accosted by robbers and left for dead. 
And who should come along that same lonely road but two holy men? First one, and then a little later another. Now certainly one of these good godly men would throw this victim a lifeline that would stop and help. But this man is lying in a ditch. The Bible said that he's half dead. That probably means that he was not conscious. He's not moving. By the looks of him, he's probably dead. And if these holy men touch a dead person, well then they will not be ritually clean for religious observations and practices. And so each one of them veers to the other side of the road as if even the smell of death would taint them. And they pass by on the other side. And then finally this Samaritan travels, uh, take him down that same road. And, and so he comes upon this man. Now, Samaritans were despised by the Jews because of their impure bloodline. During the time of the Babylonian captivity, uh, their Jewish ancestors had, had married non-Jews. And even though they still worshipped the God of Abraham, their worship was considered corrupted because their bloodline was impure. And yet, this despised Samaritan is the individual who draws near to the wounded man. He's the one that goes above and beyond what would be expected of him. Tends to the man's immediate needs and then takes him to an innkeeper where he could be better cared for. Even letting the innkeeper know that when I come back by, if I owe you anything for your care of this man, I'll, I'll gladly pay you. And then at the conclusion of the story, Jesus poses a question of his own to the lawyer. But instead of repeating who is my neighbor, Jesus reframes the question. And he asks who acted like a neighbor. I want you to notice this because this is very interesting. When he answered, the lawyer cannot even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. We sort of get the sense that he doesn't place the Samaritans under the category of neighbor. His law-induced bias will not allow his tongue to even form the word Samaritan. Instead, he just says, the one who showed mercy. Well, if this learned man had read his scriptures, and surely he did, certainly he would have known what the biblical mandate was to care for a stranger in your midst. Remember, he is a student of the first five books of the Bible, the law. Well, what did the law say? Leviticus, that falls within the first five books. It's considered the law. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 33 and 34 says this, If a stranger dwells with you in your land, 
you shall not mistreat him. The stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you. And you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Or if he happened to miss class the day that they were studying Leviticus, surely he was there on the day that they looked at the book of Deuteronomy, also one of the first five books, also the law. In the 10th chapter, verses 17 through 19, the Bible says, For the Lord your God loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Seems pretty clear to me that the biblical mandate to love our neighbor doesn't draw distinctions. Love calls us to impartiality. Love impels us to cross every humanly construed boundary. It urges us to draw near enough to recognize that our neighbor is personified in the very fact that they're a stranger. You see, love impels us to color outside the lines. And that's exactly what Jesus did. It, it was love that urged the Son of God to cross the boundary between heaven and earth. He, he stepped outside of the lines and he entered into our realm. The Bible said that he came to dwell among us because in his eyes we were not a thing to be despised, but we were objects of his love. And then his unquenchable love compelled him even further. Our burden became his burdens. He took the brokenness and the shame and the sin of the entire world, placed it upon himself. And in sharing our death, he took our sins to the grave. He crossed the line from heaven to earth. And then he crossed the line from the earth to the cross. <clears throat> From the cross, he stepped outside the lines to the grave. And from the grave, he ventured even further from death into resurrection. From resurrection into eternal glory. And he did all of that out of love for you and me. And that same love urges us to get outside of the lines today. It asks us to move beyond our comfort zone, which is a very difficult thing to do. I asked Becky if she would do a little project with our kids today. And I'm going to ask them to come and help me. Jayla, where are you at, sweetie? Jaylee, Mason. Lottie, can you come help me, sweetie? And Addie, where are you at, Addie? Can you come help today? 
Can you hold that up for everybody to see? Just hold it up in the front of you like that. It's difficult for us to get outside of our comfort zones because we start learning at a very early age to color within the lines. If you take a look at these pictures, you can certainly tell who's had the most experience. Jaylee, look how neat and decorative. And then uh, Jayla, I got Jayla and Jaylee mixed up, didn't I? Jayla's got a cross inside of her. Jaylee used multicolors, but she's all within the lines. Lottie, she did the same thing. Look at this. Thank you. All different colors, but all the colors are within the lines. I don't think this is the first heart that Lottie's ever colored. Mason? Looky there. He went... He went old school. His is all red, like a heart. Usually we see him that way. And then he's got love written in the middle of it. All within the lines. Not the first one that he's, he's colored. But let's look at Addie's. Look here at Addie's. Addie's not quite as old. She hasn't had the experience, has she? There's the cross inside. She's used multicolors to do it. Did a wonderful job. Very pretty. But look at all these marks outside the lines. She hasn't caught on quite yet that everything has to be perfect that everything has to be within the boundaries. It's not any of their faults that they all colored the way they did because that's how they've been taught. And we've been coloring inside the lines so long that that's all we know how to do. That somehow we're going to be judged, that we're going to be less than, if we get outside of those lines. But here's what the Bible says. Unless you become as little children, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Unless you become as a child, A child that just in their innocence, they just love easier. They forgive quicker. They, they can be mad at their best friend one moment and playing with them the next. They just don't hold on to those grudges because they've not been taught that that's all within the boundaries. That's all a part of that stringent law that we learn how to abide in. Coloring a heart. No damage done when you color within those boundaries. But when it comes to life, remember the question, what must I do? to inherit eternal life. The answer is based in God's truth that we first love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Jesus constantly colored outside the line. The law said you don't touch a leper. But Jesus reached out and touched him. The law said you don't heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus didn't come to abide by the law. He came to fulfill it. 
and He fulfilled it by love. And so He healed whenever and wherever there was a need. Constantly confronting the piety of the Pharisees. In Acts chapter 10, you guys can go be seated. Thank you. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm about to stop. In Acts chapter 10, the church has come into being. The Holy Spirit has come on the day of Pentecost. The church is beginning to grow. In Acts chapter 10, the Holy Spirit moved Peter to step outside of the box. Your homework, if you don't, aren't familiar with it, is to read Acts chapter 10 this week. Peter was determined that he would not be involved in anything that was unclean or uncommon. The sheep comes down. It's got all kinds of things on there that was just nasty to Peter. And the Lord said, Peter, take and eat. Not me. I'll never eat anything unclean. <coughs> and the Lord said, don't you dare call anything unclean that I have cleansed. You go to the house of Cornelius. I, I've got a Gentile family that needs to hear the gospel. And Peter, you're going to have to step outside of your Jewish boundaries. You're going to have to get your colors and you're going to have to go outside the lines today. Because I need to let the Gentiles know that I died for them too. First Christian Church, we can do no less. For standing just beyond that imaginary line that is meant to divide us. We're going to find our neighbors. And we have to keep in mind that if we want to inherit eternal life ourselves, not only do we love God, not only do we love one another as a body of believers, but we love our neighbor wherever we come in contact with them. So I'm asking you today to step outside the lines and let's get to coloring. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for these moments that you remind us that it is possible to try to dot every I and cross every T and to leave very important things undone. We're conditioned. Lord, I pray today that our minds are open to the world around us to people that need to hear the gospel, that people that need to see some kindness and compassion by those of us that claim to be followers of the way. Help us today, Lord, to joyously mark all over the lines that we might bring someone to you, that we might encourage someone to keep on trusting, to encourage someone to begin their journey with you. Father, help us to love you, but help us also to love each other and those outside of our family of faith. Help us, Lord, to do your will, to do your commands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the ways that we color outside of the lines here at First Christian Church, and I certainly 
believe that there's plenty of room for us to color outside of the lines. But one of the ways that, that we do that is when we come to the table of the Lord for communion. There are other traditions that have certain restrictions, have certain lines that are drawn. And if you do not fit within those lines, you are not uh, invited to take communion. Uh, whether that be that you have to be of the same faith or that you have to be a member of that particular church. And uh, we do not do that here at First Christian Church. So if you are a guest with us today, um, we do not require anything other than the invitation for you to come to the table of the Lord because we all come at the invitation of the Lord. This is not, this is not something that we came up with. <coughs> this is not of our own ingenuity or our own thinking processes. Man didn't just decide one day, you know, I think we ought to... I think we ought to partake of a cracker and some juice every week. No, this was, this was established by Jesus himself. This was his idea. And since it was his idea, and since we understand that it's his table, then we do not deny access to that table. Because through the table is our access to him one of them. And so today, as we do each week, we come together to give the Lord thanks for not only saying He loved us, but to demonstrate it. On the cross, He took all of our sins and made a way by which we could come to know Him and to have the hope of eternal life. On the night that he was betrayed, as he sat at supper with his disciples, he took the bread, he broke it, blessed it, gave it to them and said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, he took the cup after blessing it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink all of it. This is the new covenant in my blood. Let's bow our hearts together in prayer. Lord, as we gather today as a body of believers, I am so thankful for this group that we call First Christian Church. I'm thankful, Lord, for the privilege that it is to lead them, to minister to them each week, and together to grow with them in our relationship with you. We've not attained it all yet, none of us. And so every week we open our heart to try to learn, to try to be challenged, to be better tomorrow than we were today. And Lord, I am thankful that every week that we meet, we also meet with you. And Lord, to be able each Sunday to gather here at your table to commune with you all in our own special private way to just spend a moment to thank you Lord to invite you into this day and into our week that we desire to walk with you that we desire to be your hands and your feet that you will use us this week to minister your goodness and your love to our community. Father, today we give you glory. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.
and amen. Larry's going to come and lead us in our closing hymn today. As he comes, I invite all of us to stand and sing along with him. Here with the hymn number 508. I will sing the wondrous story. Hymn number 508. Let's stand together. today. My prayer is that you have a week that is very blessed of the Lord. Um, continue to remember all of the needs that we have in prayer. Um, one that I failed to mention, but uh, last week we were uh, excited and talked about we uh, took little baby Emerson uh, off of our prayer list because she was back home and doing good. Well, Carol told me this morning that she has COVID. And, uh, but she's, she's doing okay. She's happy and all that, but she does have COVID. So uh, and even though she's not on the prayer list right now, uh, keep her in your thoughts and prayers this week that God would continue to keep his hand over that baby. And uh, so God bless you. Uh, again, sign up sheet out in the hallway if you would like to uh, share your favorite dish at the fellowship meeting in a couple of weeks and uh, it's going to be a good week so as we are dismissed from this house today let's pray as jesus taught us to pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.